Hello and welcome back to another KCC video, I'm Rob and today we'll be jumping into Tales from Tech Support. Before we start, please hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell so you know when the next video goes live. Our story today comes to us from Law Techie, defending audits for fun and profit. Let's jump right in. I haven't told any tales for a while. This takes place after I decided to quit a cybersecurity job that I thought untenable. I had left my most recent gig and decided that I needed to take a road trip to clear my head. I packed my saddlebags, made appropriate arrangements, and headed west. I had originally planned to fly to a conference, but now I could leave early. Two days later, I was experiencing the space that is Iowa. Highways in Iowa are something of a sensory deprivation tank for me. There's the boredom of being unable to sleep on a red-eye flight or staring at a hotel room ceiling not knowing what city or time it is. Then there's a ruler straight interstate for hours. On a motorcycle, there's no radio or playlist to distract me from myself. My mind had been wandering since the Illinois border. I was going between self-doubt and wondering how much longer I could ride before I stripped naked and carried a decapitated seven-eyed goat head into a come-and-go. An image formed of the store clerk ringing up a customer. She'd turn, look at me and say, again? I took the next highway rest stop and took a break to read a book and check my mail. The email is mostly noise, but there's an email from a recruiter I like asking me to get someone through a vendor risk assessment. I've done these in the past. It's a day of dumb questions about your firewall's update schedule, and occasionally, I'll see an eldritch technical horror in the corner and varied levels of indifference about it. I should be able to distract an auditor if they hear otherworldly screaming and odd lights behind a closed door. I used to be an assessor, so I know how the game is played. I call him up. Good to hear from you. I've got a client in need called Dynapro. They just found out that they're being assessed in two days. I'd love to help you, but I'm on a road trip. I don't think I could get there by then. Are you close to an airport? Just fly to Denver from there. They'll pay expenses. Looking at the map on the wall, Denver? I can be there in two days as long as they'll pay mileage. I call the contact at the vendor and tell her that I'll be there at 8 a.m. in two days. They're a little shocked but they're good with the timing. I realize that I'm getting over on corporate America. I'm going to build the mileage. I like riding motorcycles, but being paid to ride is sweet. Normally, with these assessments, there's a spreadsheet describing the vendor's security posture and what they do for the bank demanding the assessment. Three successive unanswered emails to the recruiter and the client about those details go unanswered. During a break, I do some research on Dynapro. Their website shows they're in Utilization and Risk Management, which seems to be we offer plausible deniability for unpopular customer-facing decisions through creative outsourcing. I don't know what data they're handling or what they're doing with it. A day and a half later, I get to see Nebraska and Eastern Colorado speed by under my feet. A quick trip to a Macy's and I have a passable outfit. While I'm reading a book and eating dinner, my phone buzzes. It's recruiter's response. Here's all I have on Dynapro. It's a spreadsheet, but dated from last year and missing stuff. I still don't really know what the client uses Dynapro for, but I've learned a few things. It's possible to commit a crime against humanity with spreadsheet design. It's about 20 tabs, 12 fonts, and Jackson Pollock's sense of color. Each client department has asked questions compliance, security, ethics, and legal, using their own definitions and color scheme. And of course, there are macros. Client security department is very interested in Dynapro's logs. They want detail and how Dynapro can make them available. Usually, a bank of client size would just be happy with breach notifications and the right to view logs on request. But clients' questions imply that they want to inhale everything into their own security incident event manager. That's pretty cool. I'd love to understand how. Dynapro's answers aren't too bad. They're doing the right things, mostly in the cloud. Still a few racks of servers at a colo. Dynapro's answers about the logging stuff are incomplete and written prospectively. We can, not we do. 
I have a feeling that the only way they'll know of a breach is if the attacker tells them or breaks something. The next morning, I'm at Dynapro's office in a well-manicured office park. In the lobby, I meet Cassie, Dynapro's compliance person. She doesn't seem happy to see me, yet hands me an agenda for the day. Hi there, I was hoping to get some info and do a quick walkthrough. What information do you need? First, some coffee. Second, there's a spreadsheet you got from the bank. I have last year's, but it's incomplete. Cassie narrows her eyes as she points me to an unusually complicated coffee machine. I wasn't comfortable filling that spreadsheet out this year. That's not a good sign. I see, did the bank ask about that? They did. When I told them that we weren't going to fill it out this year, they scheduled the visit. Okay, good to know. I've got an older incomplete one. Has anything changed? I let her look at my laptop screen. She scrolls through a few minutes while I figure out the coffee machine. No, that's current. Okay, why didn't you answer the questions about logging? Legal told us not to. Oh boy, I take the fifth is rarely a reassuring answer here. Thankfully, coffee finally comes out of the coffee maker. I take my coffee and ask for a quick tour. Dynapro has a couple of cube farms. Customer service reps are answering calls for a variety of financial institutions. Signs hanging over the cubes note which large bank that group works for. Locked shredder bins are on every row. Good. Cubicles have privacy screens. Good. They even have generic security ethics posters hanging on the walls. This should make even the most stassy trained auditor happy. Then I notice something odd against one wall. There's a safe with the door smashed off. The fireproof filling is visible and flaking off. Uh, Cassie, what's this? Looking at me like I'm an idiot. It's a safe. Yeah, you spent a lot of time looking smooth and professional and this contradicts that story. Can we put this somewhere out of view? Cassie shrugs and texts someone. We find ourselves in a generic, cheap meeting room. Cassie calls someone on the speakerphone. Jürgen, the IT director, has joined the call. After a few pleasantries, I ask about my usual concerns. Patching, logging, and access. The answers I get aren't too bad, but they don't really meet the answers in the spreadsheet. Patching is whenever they have time, at least once a year. They can capture logs, but don't. They're willing to learn to keep client happy, but need guidance. Jurgen could dump a list of active users, but they're fairly open-handed with admin accounts. I hear Cassie get up. She mentions that Otto, the assessor, is here. She leaves to bring him back. Otto is older than I expected. He's got a vice president title, which doesn't really mean much at a bank. If I had to guess, his hobbies included yelling at traffic and the Minnesota Vikings, but he's going to branch out to the kids on his lawn. We start with Otto's process. We're going to go through two tabs on the spreadsheet line by line. This will be fun. Every answer requires explanation, and he never seems happy with our answers. Like, he doesn't really understand them. Now he wants to talk about Dynapro's cloud environment. Where are your data centers? They're in a top three cloud providers environment. We're in the US East and US West regions. Are all your employees who work there cleared? Uh, no. No Dynapro employees work there. All access is remote. We require that all IT staff have background checks. Right. Dynapro runs all IT staff through a seven-year check, state and federal. The cloud provider handles their own background checks. You're responsible for those checks. Well, we don't have contact with those people. I can show you their current audit report or their marketing materials. That's insufficient. We all know those are lies. Well... What would you accept to prove there's a background check? Getting annoyed. It's not my job to tell you what's acceptable proof. When we talk about logging, things get stranger. Otto wants to know what we can provide. But when we offer to output it in any format they want, Otto won't disclose a standard. This is not going well. At the end of this, we have 11 high risks. 9 about our cloud provider and 2 about logging. And 4 medium risks missing documentation like policies and schematics to remediate in the next 60 days or Otto will recommend that Dynapro's contract get modified or eliminated. To try to reduce those numbers, I ask for what they want and Otto tells me that it's not up to him but the remediation team who will contact us next week. After Otto tours the property, he leaves without any new complaints. Jurgen, Cassie, and I talk. I'm not too popular. 
since the threat of non-renewal isn't going to make Dynapro's management happy, I do promise to make the intro call with the remediation team and close these issues out before it impacts Dynapro's contract. We also start an email thread with a few Dynapro operations people to work out a reasonable way to feed event logs back to client. We work out a few proposals to pitch the remediation team, but actual work will have to wait until we hear back from the remediation team. That seems to make them happy enough. I pack up my stuff and get back on the road the next day. A few days later, I'm enjoying air conditioning, yard-long frozen drinks, and a bunch of friends for a week or so. The remediation team call is delayed long enough to allow me to travel home without incident. From the flurry of emails I'm CC'd on, it seems that Dynapro wants to spend some serious money and effort on building the capability to collect logs and pipe them to client, but would like my input. Since this is a project to make client happy, I remind everybody to hold off until we get more details from client. Cassie, Jurgen, and a few more senior Dynapro people join the call. Otto introduces Jacques, who will handle the remediation items. Cassie and Jurgen want to fight Otto with new evidence. Otto likes none of it, since Audit still can't be trusted. So we still have 15 items to fix. Jacques will review Otto's findings and will schedule weekly status calls going forward, and the call ends. I email Jacques about details on what logs they want and in what format. No response until the next day. The same usual suspects from Dynapro and Jacques. Pleasantries are short. So, I have an item about you not doing background checks. Can you explain? Sure. Dynapro performs background checks for all employees. Our cloud provider handles checks on their own. And what evidence can you show me? We submitted a redacted background check and employment contract for us. For the cloud provider, it's discussed on pages 20 and 21 in the report. I see. And physical security in the data center? Audit report, page 8. This repeats through all the high findings. Can we review the data flow diagram? I've uploaded a schematic to your share along with the updated policies. I hear some clicking and some thinking noises from Jacques. I'm going to call the four medium issues remediated. I need to talk to the previous assessor to understand why they didn't accept the audit report since it's not a remediation. This isn't where I want to go. I'd rather not have an annoyed auto re-reviewing us. Can you accept the audit report as a new remediation on your own? Puzzled. I don't see why not. But it will get checked again next year. That's going to require a new audit report from the cloud provider. I'll send Cassie a calendar invite to remind her to download it. That leaves the logging stuff. Do you have a schema you'll accept? We haven't chosen one. Okay. When you ask, we can output it the way you like when you finally decide. Can we call those issues closed as well? Jacques thinking for a few minutes. Yes, I think so. I'm fine with that. Jacques tells us that we're in the clear until next year's review, which we were going to have to do anyway. I got a dressing down from some VP at Dynapro for not ensuring a smooth process along with the check for my work, but I still got paid to ride a motorcycle. I'll call that a win. From the comments, company pleads the fifth on documentation. Client's biggest hang-up is not getting logs in a format they haven't decided on yet. Client's second biggest hang-up is whether Amazon does background checks on engineers. Client is not hung up on lack of patching or access control and declines to read the audit report. Company gets mad that their issue is resolved. Sounds like the most competent person LawTechie dealt with was the safe and it was broken. Our second story today comes to us from Jay Bainlaw. Company policy is we do not pay for overtime. Sure, okay, whatever. Let's jump right in. Sometimes as a consultant, you get to see how an office functions from an outsider perspective. Since you are an independent contractor, the company treats you differently than an employee. Also, just due to the nature of contract work, your engagement is usually short term. This makes you a temporary fixture, and sometimes are just treated as they fly on the wall like you do not exist. And this can lead to some interesting observations, including seeing train wrecks in progress. This is one of those tales, not so much about the nuts and bolts of tech support, but more about the people and some good old-fashioned just desserts. 
Background. As a consultant, you are always going to be the IT guy, whether you like it or not. No matter how you market your services, every single company is going to assume you can do anything with a computer. And when business is slow, this is not necessarily a bad thing if you just need work. About 10 years ago, I found myself in a situation. I got an inquiry through my website asking about assistance, deploying some workstations, and other mundane tasks. Usually, I would pass on this kind of work, but it was winter, and the other client work was dry that month. A guy still has to pay the bills, so I followed up, and within a day, the scope of work was signed. Easy stuff. The company had its own IT department, but just needed some extra hands. I was going to be one of three outside contractors that would deploy some workstations, do some server admin work, and set up some other equipment for a new department. The money wasn't the best, but it was time I had free, and it was all swing shift work, meaning no traffic and I get to sleep in. Not bad. The first day. I report as requested about 3 p.m. and talk to our contact. He was a senior engineer in charge of part of the IT department there, saying he really doesn't have time to do anything more than a quick introduction as they are slammed with work. He shows us the ropes and leaves us to it. Between three of us, we break down our specialties and parse out the work. Everyone knows this is a cakewalk of a job and wants to just get it done fast as the pay was flat rate. I take the server work and see my contact was the system administrator. Figuring he was probably gone for the day as it was mid-evening, I was just going to leave him a note asking him to call me. But, to my surprise, he is at his desk. In fact, just about everyone in the IT department are milling around. Didn't think much of it at the time, just that it was one busy department and the guys must be pulling double shifts. He shows me the systems and I get to work. Around midnight, we are wrapping up for the night, and the three of us break down what we have left with the senior engineer, who is still on site. The plan is to wait until Friday night to deploy the workstations and get everything in place. The senior engineer says most of his team will probably be there all weekend anyhow, so doesn't matter to him. I left thinking, man, that is a busy place. Those guys must really be pulling down the overtime. I wonder what is going on. They have so much work as I walked out the door that night. Soon enough, I would find out the deal. Friday night, head to the work site a little early on Friday, figuring if we all pull a long night, we should be able to wrap it up and all get our weekend back. Things are going great and we are ahead of schedule. So the senior engineer offers to take us out to a local diner while we wait for the office to close up so we can deploy workstations without tripping over people. At the diner, I want to thank you guys for all your hard work. We are all overworked, and when we got approval to contract out this job, everyone was excited. Hey, glad to be of service. Looks like you guys are crazy busy. Is everyone pulling doubles and doing weekends to handle your ticket load? Oh, we are understaffed, so we all have to pull extra hours. That sucks, but must be some great overtime. Overtime? Not really. We are all salaried. Some loophole or something? We just put in the time because we all need the job right now. The conversation trailed off from there, but it left me thinking. In this state, most IT workers are eligible for overtime as a matter of law. There is no loophole like that. Something isn't right. Back at the work site, I'm in the network closet with the systems administrator, hooking up some ports and finishing the server work. He is a friendly guy, so we start chatting. I was talking to your buddy, and it seems like you guys work insane hours here. I asked, trying to fish for a little information. Oh, yeah, it has been like this for a year. 60 hours is a light week these days. It is BS. Yeah, the other guy said you don't get overtime. Laughs. That is what the boss tells us. Let me show you something. He pulls up an email exchange he had with his manager. It is dated about 10 months ago and makes the very point I thought that the entire department should be getting overtime and the law requires it. His boss's response in bold and caps was, it is company policy to not pay any overtime. Working more than 40 hours is part of the job. Deal with it or find another place to work. Then the system admin smirks and shows me his response to the boss. Sure, okay, whatever. His emphasis, 
and that was the end of the exchange. Look, I'm not a lawyer, but you might want to call up the Labor Department. I'm pretty sure it is illegal for you to not be getting overtime. Then, to my surprise, the system admin pulls up another email from his personal account. Oh, it is blatantly illegal. I asked a lawyer and this was his response. He showed me a memo explaining the law and that most likely a lawsuit would be successful. This was dated about nine months ago. Confused. So you guys know you should be getting overtime but not getting paid and everyone is okay with that? We all make sure to log all of our hours and document the time. Still confused. But you still aren't getting actually paid overtime? No, but we will. Here is the kicker. According to the lawyer, the labor department will look back at the hours we put in for the last 12 months and award us retroactive overtime. So all of us just log our time and keep records. Then in about a month, we are going to file and claim them all together. The company is going to be on the hook for all that overtime and they won't be allowed to fire any of us for reporting them either. Then the coup de grace. We all figured when this whole thing started, if we pressed the point back then, they would just figure out a way to screw us. So we just all decided to stay quiet, put in the time they tell us to work, and we will get our bonus check when it is all said and done if this stuff is all backdated. Damn, that is some cold stone strategizing. How many hours do you think you guys have piled up? Hard to tell. Everyone keeps their own paper logs to keep it quiet. We also don't talk about it too much, so nothing gets out, but last time we met outside of work, it was a boatload of time. I figure, for myself, they will owe me about 13 to 14 months of salary in overtime, and when it's all said and done, add up damages, penalties, interest, it will probably total almost two years of pay. Holy. So, if the guys won't talk about it and seem eager to work all these long hours, now you know why. We finished up the job that night. I exchanged contact information with a few guys and said if they had any other contract work to think about giving me a call. That was it until three months later. I am at another job and see an email come in from the systems administrator. Subject line, overtime claim. Hey IT guy, hope you're doing well. We all ended up filing a big overtime claim with the state and the company fired us for supposedly falsifying our timesheets. The lawyer is sorting it all out. But anyway, I wanted to know if I could give your name to an investigator who is looking for witnesses to verify some of the extra hours we worked. Some details followed. I agreed to talk to the investigator and got a call about a week later. He asked me some routine questions about times and dates and wanted me to email him over some proof I did the job. Then he started going into the details of the case. We got this company for probably a million in overtime and damages between all the guys in the department. Plus, the firing is probably illegal, so that is going to be another few hundred thousand on top of it. The insurance company wants to settle, and once we wrap up the due diligence work, I think these guys are all going to make it out rather nicely. I didn't hear anything for a while until another email came in from the systems administrator. Subject line, RE, overtime claim. I just wanted to let you know we settled this whole thing. Company caved pretty quickly once it was clear we kept honest logs of our time, and the local management violated parent company regulations for the sake of making their site budget look better. Can't go into details, but we all got sizable checks, enough to pay off some loans and go back to school. I'll have to find a new job, but after I get my grad degree, that shouldn't be an issue. Appreciate you talking to the investigators. Thanks, IT guy. I don't know about you guys, but I think there were too many variables at play here. What happened if the company went bankrupt or if they shut down before you even had a chance to get your claim in? I'm glad it worked out for them, but there were so many cards on the table, they could have fallen in the wrong direction. Thank you to both OPs for posting their stories in the Tales from Tech Support subreddit. They are linked in the description down below. Please go check them out. Check out one of these other videos, and if you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories.